Cornerstone, good morning. Um, go ahead and turn in your Bibles over to Luke chapter 24. We will begin there in a moment. Thank you so much, my brother. Um, it is Resurrection Sunday. Uh, it is Easter Sunday, and I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited I forgot one of my props. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, so, yeah, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, the day we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am uh, uh, just, again, excited to be here with you, thankful for all of you coming to worship our Lord with us. It's been an amazing worship service. I mean, I know that my heart is full, my lungs are tired, uh, but my soul is energized, you know, just as we worship God and praise our Lord. You know, speaking about the resurrection, I want to have, go ahead and Jaden stand up. Jaden LaFranceville, stand up. <laughs> So Thursday night, Jaden was baptized into Christ, and uh, amen, amen. And so he has been raised again uh, to new life, to new life. So big, uh, just excited for you, brother, excited. Thank you, Lamar and Ethan and all the, the teens and other brothers that were studying uh, with Jaden. Just excited to see you join God's kingdom, my brother. Um, so he is risen. Um, you ever have those situations where you're looking for something or maybe you send your kids to look for something and, uh, you know, they come back and say, mommy, daddy, I couldn't find it. Well, in, in our household, Natasha has a, a general question after that happens. She says, did you mommy look for it or daddy look for it? <laughs> uh, because, you know, uh, oftentimes... <laughs> You know, just like my children, I will go to find something and um, I'll say, I just can't find it. And then Natasha will come and be like, it's right there, honey. You know, uh, the very definition of if it was a snake, it would have bit you, you know. Um, well, I wanted to do a little exercise because maybe that's just me or maybe you guys can sort of uh, sometimes have these same sort of things where you're looking for something that's right in your face and you miss it. So in a moment, we're gonna show a picture of a messy bathroom. And when we look at this picture, I want you to see if you can find uh, a toothbrush, okay? There's a toothbrush in this messy bathroom and I want you to see if you can find it. We're only gonna put the picture up for three seconds, so look fast, look hard, and see if you can find the messy toothbrush. So Erica, if you can go ahead and put that picture up for three seconds, can you find the missing toothbrush? One, two, three. All right, take it away. Take it away. All right. Now, there are, you know, <laughs> did you mommy look or daddy look, you know, at that? How many of you saw the toothbrush, right? What color was it? It was green, blue, and white. All right. Uh, Erica, can you put the picture back up for me one more time? How many of you saw that long black toothbrush? Be honest if you actually saw the long black toothbrush that was there, right? Uh, yeah, did you see it? <laughs> did you see it? Probably not. Uh, you didn't imagine that you'd come to church on Easter and be playing a game of where's Waldo, but you know, we do all kind of things. Uh, so if you miss that toothbrush, you are suffering from a condition that lots of people have. Don't worry, it's not a fatal condition. Uh, it's what scientists and, and psychologists at the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, they did a study and they coined this term inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness is generally the failure to notice something that is fully visible, but perhaps not expected. Some of you may have seen, uh, there, there's lots of experiments like this. There's a video where they say, count how many times these kids pass the ball around. And so you're watching them count, and uh, afterwards they say, did you see the gorilla in the video? And then they go back and show it slow-mo, and you were counting the ball, and this, this gorilla comes in the middle and is doing a dance, and you just didn't even see the gorilla in the video. It's because it wasn't expected, and you were perhaps looking at something else. Well, today for our communion time, I want to look at a couple of folks in the Bible that had inattentional blindness. And maybe you're the same way, uh, maybe not, but uh, they talk about two reasons that this generally 
occurs. Let's read over in Luke chapter 24. We're going to read verses 13 through 35. This is one of my absolute favorite resurrection appearances. Um, over in Luke chapter 24, it's called the road to Emmaus. And so many of you may be familiar with this passage, um, but basically this is Resurrection Sunday. Uh, Jesus was risen from the dead. He had appeared to the women earlier that morning. They went back and ran to the men and said, hey, uh, you know, the Lord, his body's not there. And some of them even said he's been risen, but the men didn't believe it. Peter and John rushed back to the tomb. They find the empty, empty grave clothes and they walk away right? Wondering what happened. And so Jesus comes to the road to Emmaus. And we're going to pick up in verse uh, 13 in Luke chapter 24 and read this story about the resurrection. It says, now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged or they looked sad. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? Pardon me. What things? Jesus asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. And our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish and slow you are to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. I think these two men on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and another unnamed disciple, were suffering from inattentional blindness. Not unattentional, but inattentional blindness. The failure to see something so obvious that was right there in front of them. Uh, the, the researchers at, 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 at UCSB, they said there are really two general reasons why someone uh, suffers or experiences inattentional blindness. Reason number one is often that one's attention can be focused on or distracted by something else. So there's something right in front of you. It's obvious. It's clear. And you miss it because you're focusing in on something else. In that picture, you immediately saw the little green toothbrush, right? And so you didn't notice this massive black toothbrush behind it because you were focused in on that one little toothbrush. Well, I think these guys that were walking, you know, after having been devastated seeing Jesus crucified, after having been disappointed that all the plans they had made, they were probably feeling the Jesus movement is over. They were quitting, going home. And as they're going home, they start talking and discussing everything. I think these guys, what, what kept them in the darkness, what, what blinded them was their emotions. Oftentimes, I think our emotions, our situations can blind us to Jesus. You ever been there? You ever been so sad that all you can think about is your sadness? 
Ever been so angry that maybe you lose control? so discouraged or devastated that you can't get out of your own head. You see, I think this is what these guys experienced. They went from being sad to being irritated to even arguing on the road. I'm sure one guy's like, but, you know, Jesus, he said he was going to do all these things. And, and maybe Cleopas was like, yeah, but that's come to nothing. And, and maybe the other disciples like, hey, but remember all the things he did? Th- this can't be the end. And the other guy's like, well, you saw it, didn't you? And I think they were blinded to the situation that Jesus himself came up and walked with them because they were clouded by their emotions. Now, the thing, as as Dearest once said to me, emotions are are good indicators, but they're not good leaders. They're good to take a pulse, right? It's good that we feel, right? God has a big heart. God feels, right? God grieves, right? God rejoices, right? God designed us to experience emotion, And they're good indicators, but they're not good leaders. You want a case in point? Will Smith. On what should have been the biggest night of his career, right? The crowning achievement for an actor, right? To win the Oscar for best actor or best actress. Nobody's going to remember anything else from that night but him slapping Chris Rock. His emotions clouded his judgment. And I know that, you know, we can pick on Will Smith, but it happens to us. I heard someone once say, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. Any of the parents in the room, you can attest. When, you're, when your kids are going through something, you're going through something. Right? Or maybe you've gone through health challenges. It's so awesome to see Betsy here. Hey, Betsy. <laughs> hey, Betsy. <laughs> hey, Steve. Right? They've been in the battle. I'm sure at times they felt like this is all there is right now, what they're going through. Unless you've been living under a rock the past two years, the isolation, the fear, you may have had COVID yourself, or maybe one of your loved ones had COVID. And again, I had it. All I could do was sit in the bedroom and watch old movies. I mean, I didn't even want to send emails. I mean, it was just, it was debilitating. And it dominated my world. Maybe you're having trouble in your marriage. Right? You just feel like, man, this, this time, this, we've been married this long. Why are we still going through these things? Why are we still fighting over the same old stuff? Maybe you're, you're, you're just having troubles on your job and you haven't gotten the promotions or, or there were things that you wanted and it hasn't happened and you're angry about it. Maybe you've experienced the death in the family. I don't know, but like these guys, I'm sure all of us in this room have been to a point where you've just been stopped in your tracks. It said Jesus started talking to them and it said they just stopped and looked downcast. Think about this first sort, sort of unintentional blindness, I I wanted to put before you that Jesus is with us, even when you're going through whatever it is. The thing that I take encouragement about this story, they were sad, they were devastated, they were discouraged, they were going through some things, and Jesus himself was still with them. Whatever you're going through, whatever you related to a moment ago, as I talked about the difficulties that we can have in life, right now, I know, and we sang that song, you can feel alone. But Jesus, because he is risen from the dead, he can be everywhere at once. He is with us. You know, I went through, uh, you know, what I feel like was probably the toughest time of my life. I was in college. Um, Natasha and I had been dating. We'd broken up. Um, I don't know, within a day or two of that, I'd gone out to play basketball like an idiot. I wore low tops. Uh, And... Sure as shooting, I twisted my ankle very badly. I mean, it was so bad. It was like a tennis ball on the side of my ankle. They had to take me to the, you know, they called the paramedics. I had to go to the hospital. First time in college, I was failing some classes. I was not doing well spiritually. Had a roommate and we had uh, bunk beds and I was supposed to be on the top bunk, but because my leg was so hurt, I couldn't even get up there. So I just had to sleep on the couch. And I remember there was one night I'm sleeping on the couch 
I'm thinking about my life and the, the tragedy, the devastation. That, I mean, I can't even get up to my bunk to sleep. So I got to sleep on the couch. I remember looking out the window that was right in front of the couch and, uh, you know, those yellowish orange light, street light type lights, right? I remember just seeing that sort of light come through the window and it was raining. And I remember just sitting there thinking, I just want to jump out that window. It just felt like too much. I'd lost a relationship. I'm failing at school. I'm not doing well spiritually. My leg is, you know, I got to take the stingerette around campus and wear crutches around campus. And, and it, was just, it was just a horrible, horrible time in my life. And maybe if you haven't been there, wait a little longer. Life can get you there. Faithful, spiritual, no matter how long you've been a disciple. I mean, think about the people in the Bible. Jonah, right? Look in Jonah chapter 4. It starts off with him being angry and basically saying, God, just let me die. I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were going to save the Ninevites. Just let me die here. Elijah had just slaughtered the prophets of Baal, and then Jezebel comes after him. And so he runs away. He sits down, and he basically is like, God, just let me die. And so when you're feeling that type of overwhelmed, as I was, the thing that ended up sustaining me, the thing that got me through it is I started looking around for Jesus. When you're going through that, Jesus is near, right? Take heart. The Lord is near. And if you don't think he can relate, go back to, to Jesus praying in the garden. He said to his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus said, I'm so sad right now, I feel like I'm going to die. I don't want to go through that. He prayed, Father, right, in this moment of being in trouble and, and sorrow, he said, Father, if there's any other way, I know we've been planning this for millennia, but if there is any other way, please let this cup pass from me. I think even Jesus was tempted with inattentional blindness to sort of feel like, where is God? This, the emotions were overwhelming to him. And he went to God. Took him three times. I love that detail. <laughs> He's perfect. He's God in the flesh. And he needed to pray three times to get his heart right. Right? But he went to God and people say over and over again, Calvary was won in Gethsemane. He looked around, he looked to his father and he took comfort, right? God even sent him an angel, as it says in Luke's gospel, to comfort him. And he's sweating blood, but, but he says, get up, rise. Here comes my betrayer. Let's go. And he was ready to go. So when you are going through the devastating things that life will put us through, and sometimes they can make us blind to the fact that Jesus is with us, look around, look up. He is with you. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He is with you. The second reason that uh, psychologists give for inattentional blindness is a lot of times the object was either unexpected or just larger than expected. So I love this story. They're walking along, and Jesus shows up, and he's walking with them, and, and they can't recognize him. And he's like, what are y'all arguing about? And they're like, you know, uh, they just stopped. He said, haven't you heard the things, all these things? And he's like, I love Jesus. What things? Tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. You know, what things? And they go on to say about, about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet. Notice they don't say he was the Messiah. They don't mention he was the son of God. What they've been through had devastated them to the point of losing some faith. Well, he must have just been a prophet. They don't mention that he was king. They certainly don't say he was God in the flesh. Because I, you know, I watched him die. And then they say, they, 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 they say this phrase, and I used to say this is the saddest phrase in all the English language. I think there's one sadder, but we had hoped. We had hoped our marriage would be better at this point. We had hoped I'd have a family by now. That I wouldn't still be single at this point in my life. We had hoped I would make more money and be able to provide. We had, we had hoped to overcome this illness by now. We've been praying. We had hoped for it. 
But you know, the only phrase sadder than we had hoped, I think would have been, I had hoped. At least they had a buddy. I had hoped. Imagine going through that alone, as some of you out there may feel right now. I had hoped that these things or this would happen. All right? They had lost faith. They were discouraged. And I think what, what had happened is Jesus himself showed up, and it was completely unexpected. Not only was he prophet and powerful in word and deed, he was God in the flesh, and they missed it. It was bigger than they expected. He was more than they could have even imagined. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't even fathom after seeing him on that cross that he'd be walking with us, just talking with us on the road. It was bigger than expected. You know, the love of God is a lot like that. We've all experienced conditional love. And so the idea that there is actually unconditional love, there is one who would send a son, his only son, to die for me. There's one who loves me and accepts me no matter what. There's one who has seen my sin and still says, come to the altar. It's too big. It's like you can't almost understand it because it just seems impossible that there's that kind of love. But that's exactly what it is. And we can have inattentional blindness to it. They didn't expect Jesus to be there. You know, how many disciples, uh, if you read all the Gospels, how many of the disciples were like expecting that Jesus was actually going to be back that morning? Zero. Read all the Gospels. Even the women that went to the tomb, they weren't expecting to see him. They were like, we need to go re his body. I know Nicodemus and uh, Joseph. The men didn't do it right, right? They, they daddy look at things. We got to make sure that it's, that it's right, <laughs> right? They weren't going expecting that Jesus was going to be there. Even after they come back and report, Peter and John, run, his closest friends, they run to the tomb. They find the empty clothes. Everything is pointing to he's raised from the dead. And it says they walked away wondering what had happened. <laughs> and I don't have time to get into it, but if you read over and over again, right, uh, Luke 8, uh, 43 and in Luke chapter 18, 34, he says very plainly, the Gentiles are going to arrest me. They're going to spit on me, flog me, kill me. And on the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. He says this plainly over and over and over again. And it says they missed it. It was too big of an idea for them to imagine. So the story goes on. And again, I love this about Jesus. It says he acted like he was going to go farther. Kind of reminds me of uh, when he fed the 5,000 and he asked Philip, you know, what, what do we have? He already knew what he was going to do. He already had in mind what he was going to do. But he says, you know, what do, you, what do we have to give them? You give them something to eat, right? So Jesus acted like he was going further and like, stay with us. After he's expounded the scripture to them and then they're sitting down at the table and, and he breaks the bread and suddenly they recognize him. Two cures for inattentional blindness that we can have. The first is we need to look for Jesus in the word. So their hearts were burning. They had spiritual heartburn. You know what that's like when you read a scripture or you listen to a sermon. And it's like, man, has Fenton been following me around all week? Because, uh, you know, how is he talking about exactly what I'm going through? It ain't me. I ain't got that kind of time, right? It is, it is the spirit. It is the word of God. It is meant. God has put eternity on the hearts of men. It is meant to burn in your heart. And I know for me, it changed my life. God's word can change your life. The second thing I think help them is, you know, they found Jesus in the stranger. When they kind of got out of their heads and out of their sadness and said, let's be hospitable. Hey, come in and stay with us. When they got back to the things that Jesus had taught them about how, what it means to love other people as yourself and to give your all, right? They invited him in and suddenly as they sat around the table, breaking bread with him, they recognized Jesus. The second thing that can help us with this inattentional blindness is we've got to look for the stranger. When you look for the needs, when you, look, when you come into church and say, who can I encourage today? Who can I pray for today? Yeah. Right? And that doesn't minimize the struggles and things that we go through, but God just sort of designed us that when we give, we are given to. He literally says, give and I'll give it back to you. Press down, shaking together, running over. I'm going to pour it into your lap. He just designed us that as we give, we are given back to. Amen. Last thing I want you to think about. So often we use the term and expression, man, I need to find God. Some of you are probably saying that this morning. I need to find God. 
Jesus went to find them. Jesus is coming to find you. When you're going through whatever it is you're going through, he's going to walk with you on the road to Emmaus. When you're going through that health challenge, that marital challenge, your kids are acting bonkers and driving you crazy. He's coming to find you. When you're crying on a couch, thinking about jumping out a window, it all seems like it's falling apart. Jesus is coming to find you. That is the beauty of the resurrection. He is risen. We no longer have to walk in darkness or in blindness. He said, I'm the light. And so as we take communion, we're going to have instrumental during the communion, right? We can have uh, the singers or the instrumentalists come on up. As we take communion today, I want you to think about a couple things. You know, in the garden, Adam and Eve blew it and sort of doomed all of humanity in a garden. Jesus overcame in a garden. All right? Adam and Eve covered themselves and hid behind a tree because they were ashamed and naked. Jesus was strung up naked on a tree, taking our shame, taking our nakedness, taking our scorn. Right? The curse that was given to them was thistles and thorns. What did Jesus wear on his head as he was crucified? The curse is lifted. The curse is removed. He is walking with you. We need to open our eyes. Find Jesus in the word. Find Jesus in the stranger. Find Jesus in your difficulty because he is walking with you. Let's, uh, I'm going to pray. And then uh, we'll, we'll take the, uh, the broken body of the Lord, uh, represented by the, the, the bread there. And then we'll take uh, the fruit of the vine, representing his blood that is spilled out. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much um, that God, even when we're inattentionally blind, perhaps overwhelmed by our situations, by our emotions, by our sadness, our anger, our disappointment, our loneliness, our fear. Help us to find faith. Help our faith to be bigger than our fear. And we can find that in Jesus. Father, help us to understand, even though it seems unfathomable, how big and wide and deep your love is. That God would send a son, that God would push his son in front of a moving automobile, so to speak. That God would, excuse me, put the the noose around his neck, that would put the nails in his hands instead of mine. That That is such a lofty idea. It's too wonderful for me to fathom. Wonderful for me to fathom. And so I can be inattentionally blind to how big and great and amazing your love is. God, help us to see it. Open your eyes as you did to the servant Gehazi for Elijah. Open the eyes as Jesus did time and time to blind men and blind women. God, I pray that we can see the light that is Jesus, and he will open our eyes and remove our inattentional blindness. Father, help us to find him in the word. Help us to find him in in the person that is in need, in the stranger walking along the road. Help us to find him in our difficulty. As he is saying, I am the king, and yet I invite you to sup with me at my table. I want you to be with me. So much so that he was willing to be tortured and brutally killed. But thank you, God, that he was raised to life. I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God because of what Jesus did on Calvary. And he was raised to the dead. And now he's sitting, reigning on the throne and pleading on our behalf. Father, as we take this bread and this blood, help us to remember that he is with us, that he is walking with us, even in the toughest of times, and he wants us to be with him. Let us run back, as they did to Jerusalem, to say the Lord has risen. Let us run back after today and tell those around us, he is risen. Thank you so much, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.